Good morning. I'm Roseanne Roberts, one of the pastors here at Wesley, and Reverend Peter Hay and I would like to welcome you to this worship service, where together we grow with God through praising, prayer, and the word, and where we go to serve, living out our discipleship in faith and action, serving one another and our world. Let us join our hearts in prayer. We worship you, almighty God, for you knew us before we were born. You love us into life. Open our hearts and our spirits today to hear your word for us. And upon hearing the word, may we be convinced of our call to ministry and mission through your church. Bless us with your presence and your powerful love, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as you're able and join our voices in our first hymn, I Am Thine, O Lord. Somewhere only we 
Please stand as you are able and join me in reading responsively Psalm number 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes shall stumble and fall. Though the camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war rise against me, yet will I be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire to the Lord's temple. The Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and will set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies round about me, and I will offer sacrifices in the Lord's tent. With shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother shall forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. It is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collectors. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, I tell you. This man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Won't you please be seated? And would you pray with me? And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Lillian Daniel has sparked off quite a conversation within the circle of the mainline church she published a book entitled, When Spiritual But Not Religious Isn't Enough. She offers a rather frank critique of a particular worldview that seems to be very prominent in American culture right now. I find her tone uh, somewhat unsettling. I really don't like the way that she writes and the way she presents what she has to say. But I think she has some important insights that if we think about them together, we'll become stronger Christians and better people. Now, part of the reason I don't like what she does is she employs a, a rather old tried and true rhetorical technique called the straw man. Although in the days of inclusivity, we should say the person of straw. <laughs> and what that is, is you, you uh, assemble into one place a large grouping of stereotypes <laughs> and, and connect them all together and say, this is what I'm going to argue against. And then you sort of attack it by uh, uh, assailing some of its positions and some of its points. I don't like that technique because it, it's based on stereotypes. It's based on being prejudicial. It's based on assuming you know something about someone else when you're simply operating on a stereotype. The other thing I don't like about her is she tends to employ a fair amount of sarcasm. And I'm not a big fan of sarcasm. I try not to speak sarcastically. I know, dear, I could do better at that. <laughs> Why do you sit in the front row? <laughs> and I really don't like it when someone speaks to me sarcastically. I remember when I studied Greek in college, the verb sarke, from which sarcasm is derived, means to tear flesh. So when you're being sarcastic, you're doing something you probably really don't want to do. But nonetheless, Lillian Daniels has concocted this image of spiritual but not religious, making a number of critiques, saying mainly that the spiritual but not religious spend too much time 
focusing simply on the God of creation, too much time simply feeling lucky, and too much time withdrawn from community. Now, whether those stereotypes are true or not, um, we'll have at them nonetheless. And we'll start with the parable that Jesus told. Now, I don't think Jesus makes a straw, a person of straw argument with the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I think the text makes it very clear that these are not real people. Jesus isn't walking through the temple, seeing two people, pointing at one and uh, dumping a whole host of stereotypes on the other, nor is he pointing to the other person and laden, uh, ladening that person with stereotypes. It's a very transparent story, that the meaning is very clear, that we're not talking about people, we're talking about an attitude. And what the Pharisee embodies is problematic, and what the tax collector embodies is virtuous. The Pharisee is pretentious. That is, he comes before God with great gratitude that he's doing okay. He's able to follow the law and keep its commands. He proudly puffs himself up by bragging on all his accomplishments. He's been able to do everything that he's supposed to do. And he compares himself to those who haven't been quite as successful. And he's puffing himself up. He asks for nothing. He accepts no challenge. He makes no promises. And he leaves the divine presence just as he had come into the divine presence. There's no engagement. There's no movement. There's no growth. The tax collector, on the other hand, is anything but pretentious. He does not wallow in self-pity by listing the laundry list of his many sins. But he just knows in his heart that he hasn't been all that he could be. He hasn't done all that he could do. He knows that he's done some things that he ought not to have done. And he has left undone important matters. Prayer for him is an inward journey, an encounter with limitation and an attempt to transcend and to grow and to renew. I think a faithful life is about trying to transcend. It's about trying to get better. It's about trying to step beyond where we failed before and reach for something more noble. Well, one of the stereotypes that Lily and Daniel uh, attacks in the people who identify as spiritual but not religious is expressed in a phrase that She's heard many, many times. I know as a pastor, it's a, it's a phrase I've heard many times, and I'm sure you've heard it once or twice as well. I don't need to go to church to feel close to God. I experience God in nature. I get more out of a sunset than I do out of a worship service. And if not a sunset, maybe it's a, you can substitute a hike in the woods, or maybe you could substitute a sail on a sailboat. Now, I own a rather small sailboat. I love to hike, 
and sunsets are quite endearing. But the word of challenge that I would speak in response to that statement is that God is not limited to the role of creator. And if we only worship at nature's altar, we only worship a small portion of the fullness of God. Yes, God made the world and God's wonder can be inspiring. But all is not glorious in the realm of nature. You see, it takes very little effort to experience God in the wonders of creation. Finding God in nature is actually rather quite easy. It takes no particular skill, no advanced discipline and training in your own heart and your own mind. It's rather rudimentary. It's a bit like saying, I discovered water in the ocean. It may be an aha moment for some, but come on. <laughs> There's more to God. There's more power. There's more love. There's more grace. There's more to God than the world that God made. And remember, too, creation can be something of a mixed bag. Lovely sunsets on warm summer nights are inspiring, but what do you do with the bone-chilling cold of a New England winter when people freeze to death? Bunnies are cute, but creation has sharks and tigers and grizzly bears. And if we only worship at nature's altar, we will not learn how to live well in creation. You know, we have this really nice cat, which is a strange thing for me to say, because uh, Kathy's had all kinds of cats, and I haven't really been fond of any of them until this one's come along. She's quite different. She greets us at the door when we come through. She'll crawl up in our lap, and, and she'll... She'll purr when we pet her. She really is a lovely cat. But there's a dark side to her story. <laughs> and we got her from my cousin Jimmy, who's a vet. And he got her from someone who brought her in not once but twice. First time the cat came in, it had a bloody nose. The owner said it fell. Cats don't get bloody noses. Second time, the owner brought the kitten in. It had two crushed hips. Jimmy called the police, called his friend who's a surgeon, who reconstructed. You see, nature has shadows to it. I'm sorry. And if we only worship what is, we have to worship some things that are troubling. Creation is not God. And there is a part of God that is above and beyond creation that beckons us to be better people and to make creation more holy. What is, is not enough. Worshiping at nature's altar will not call us beyond what is to what ought to be. The second point that Lillian Daniels challenges those who identify as spiritual but not religious comes from a critique that she had with a proud father. The proud father began to uh, brag on the spiritual, spirituality of his son, saying this, 
My son gets it. The other day, he said that there were children in the world who live with hunger and warfare, that many go to sleep hungry and fearful. The father was rightly proud of the son's sensitivity. And the son went on to say that in response to all of that difficulty, He said, I'm lucky because I live here and not there. I'm lucky? I believe that feeling lucky in the face of a broken world is woefully inadequate. We ought to feel angry the way you sparked anger when I told you what happened to that little kitten. We ought to feel angry. The God of the Bible is not the God of the lucky and the strong. The biblical God hears the cry of an enslaved people and raises up a liberator. The biblical God sees the chosen people behaving in ways that are profoundly unjust and raises up a mighty army of prophets who speak a challenging word to the throne of Israel. The biblical God is not a God of the lucky. And wouldn't we have to say that Jesus of Nazareth is one of the most unlucky people to have ever lived? The proper response to human agony and injustice is not salvation by luck. It should be anger. The civil rights movement didn't happen because Martin Luther King Jr. felt lucky, though he was. As an African-American, he was able to go to college. He earned a doctoral degree. He wanted to be an intellectual preacher. He was lucky. He could have stayed in that ivory pulpit. He could have had a wonderful career writing and teaching and preaching. He could have been lucky right up to a big fat pension and retirement. But he surrendered lucky. He traded in luck for an epic struggle for racial justice and human wholeness. God's really not interested in anybody feeling lucky. God's calling us to action. God didn't just create a world. God's seeking to save us from our own misery and awakening that spirit within you and within me right now. And that's, that's where the whole church thing comes in. Church isn't a club where we get together and sing the songs that we like and greet our friends with warmth. God didn't just make the world with all its beauty. God made human beings with all their glory and even their messiness. If you want to be advanced in the spiritual and the religious realm, try looking for God, not in a sunset, but in a human face. Well, it's easy to see God in the face of someone who loves you. It's wonderful to see God, especially in our children, when they kind of parrot back to us the the kind of values we're trying to instill. It gets a little more challenging, though, when your children grow. (laughs) When our children choose paths for themselves that we would not choose for them. It takes a deeper spirituality than the God of a sunset 
to stay bonded and to stay engaged as they grow through the different stages of life. Sunsets aren't enough. Lucky won't cut it. It's easy to see God in the face of a friend who shares our values and affirms our political views. It gets a little harder when they have a different point of view, a different set of commitments. I wonder, do we dare to see God in the face of Trevon Martin? Do we dare to see God in the face of Michael Brown? Well, if we do that, we might be doing something of value, something of use, something that might move us from the wonders of creation and the blessedness of luck toward a rebuilding of righteousness for all people. When we can see God in the heartbroken face of African-American parents who grow weary from teaching their children things that I never had to teach mine. And can we see God in the face of so many police officers who eagerly want to serve and protect a great nation but do so with risk and with fear, with insecurity and trepidation? On this Sunday closest to Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, might we dare to see God even in the face of our racial conflicts, not worrying about who's right and who's wrong, but praying for a better day for all. The glories of creation and feeling lucky won't get us there. But the God that we know in Jesus Christ is yearning for that day. Well, I really don't know how accurate Lillian Daniel's straw person argument is with respect for all those who claim to be spiritual but not religious. But I do know that finding God in the beauty of nature is only the starting point for a life of faith. I don't know if Lillian Daniels is right when she says that all of the spiritual but not religious see themselves as lucky. But I do, but I do know that God wants us to feel more than lucky. God wants us to feel angry at injustice. And I don't know if Lillian Daniels is right when she says that people withdraw from the church because they just can't bear to be around people who might have an opinion different from their own. But I do know that if we really work together if we really engage one another with integrity in mission and service, that we'll make a difference for God and for our neighbor. Amen. As the ushers wait upon us for our morning offering, I would call your attention to a special envelope in the bulletin. Uh, it's one of our six special Sundays when we take an offering for the general church. Human Relations Day is an offering that helps particularly folks who are ethnic minorities uh, experience blessings of education. So if you'd like to help with that, we would be grateful. As a forgiven and forgiving people, let us share our gifts. Sound who 
Gracious God, we thank you that you have blessed us with an abundance of gifts. May this offering of our life and our labor reveal your love as we seek to share your promised reign with all of your world. Amen. Please be seated. I do have three quick announcements I'd like to make this morning. The first is that right after this service at about 11.45 or 12 o'clock, there'll be the initial meeting of our church's uh, confirmation program. So if you're interested in that and uh, would like to know more about it, this is for our, our young people, and that'll be right after the service in Hannah Hall. I'd also like to remind you that we're, our youth group is selling uh, Super Bowl subs for Super Bowl Sunday, and if we sell enough of them, the Patriots will be in the Super Bowl. So, uh, and you can actually order them online now. Dev Venator has set up a way you can do that. So uh, uh, if you'd like to help out with missions, we'd be pleased for that. And then on the 27th of January, we are blessed that our Bishop, Bishop Devadar, will be with us. It's his day on the district, and we're privileged uh, to host it. Uh, the bishop will be meeting with the ministers and the clergy from 2 o'clock 
in the afternoon till about five o'clock, and then there'll be a supper together. And then after supper, the bishop is pleased to meet with uh, uh, the clergy and lay members of the churches as well. So if you'd like an opportunity to uh, get to meet our bishop, you have one, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. So those are the announcements I'd like to share with you. And Roseanne, would you uh, lead us in prayer? As people of God, we come together in our need. Gracious and wise God, we are your people, and you have called this church into being to serve you in this world by helping others, by loving others. We offer our prayers for each other, for those near and dear to us. For the situations of difficulty and strife in this community and in our world. <clears throat> we lift to your care those that mourn. And for the injustices of our world, God, you hear our voices cry out, and with your eternal compassion, you respond in loving care for each person. We gather here this day, meeting and greeting, celebrating, sharing friendship. You remind us that you are always with us. So what do we have to fear? but we fear far, far too often the unknown tasks that lie ahead of us. And so you want us to be assured of your presence and your guidance. Help us remember that there is no time in which we are out of your care. Enable us to be a serving ministry and mission that we might go with your confidence, filled with your joy. Gracious God, heal our wounds, bind up our bruises and broken spirits, and put us on a right path, the right path to peace. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name, and it is Jesus who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us sing, stand and sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior.
the score was 14 to 14 with nine seconds left. And uh, one of the players in my basketball game yesterday ran down the court and put up a shot, got fouled. First foul shot, she bent her knees, bent her waist, put the ball up, missed the backboard, missed the rim, hit the wall. But she had another shot. She made it. We won. Go and know that you belong to the God who gives you another shot. <laughs> However, you may have disappointed yourself and someone else in this week. Well, there's a new week ahead. Go to live as a servant of love and justice and righteousness. Go in peace. Go in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.